grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. I don't know if I'm really proud to tell you this, but my wife and I have recently found ourselves watching more and more of a particular kind of video on YouTube. These are called fail videos. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you are shaking your head no. These are videos, I mean, it's just what it sounds like, videos of people failing at what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish. Now, I find them funny. My wife finds them absolutely hilarious. If you want to hear a belly laugh from my wife, a good fail video is where you're going to get it. Now, before you start thinking that we're just enjoying people's misery, these are not videos of people like failing the SAT course. Okay? This isn't something that someone has put earnest effort into and really tried and then unfortunately come up short. Now these videos are people failing at things they should have never been doing in the first place. Something that you knew wasn't going to end well the moment you saw them try and do it. For example, I saw a guy trying to use two 12-foot ladders as stilts. And you knew as soon as he started to climb the one ladder how that whole thing was going to end, right? I saw two big guys, and I say that as a big guy, but these were much bigger than me at a playground, and they both decided it would be fun to get on the children's teeter-totter together. <laughs> see, you didn't even see it, and you're laughing. Yeah. I always love the ones where the couples are at the beach and they're taking pictures, especially if they're in their wedding gown and their tuxedo, and they go walking out onto the jetty where the waves are crashing, and come on, really? <laughs> you don't know how that's going to end? <laughs> it always does. One of the most confounding to me, uh, and I don't know how recent this is, but they've come out with hoverboards. Now, they're not really hoverboards. They're just two wheels, and it's like a skateboard, but you can go forward kind of like the, uh, the other ones that you have with your, the, the handles on it. I forget what, people mover or segway. Thank you, yeah. And uh, they open them at Christmas time, and of course, everybody's so excited, and they always do the same thing. They're inside, take it out of the box, and try it right there in the living room or right there in the kitchen, and you know what's going to happen next, right? Yep comes right out from under him, knocks the Christmas tree over, Christmas table, it's all, all a mess. Most of the time, my wife and I end up scratching our heads, and I'll say something like, well, what did you think was going to happen? Right? When it comes to Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness, maybe I'm alone here, but I start to think the same thing. What did you think was going to happen, Satan? Satan? Did you really think you were going to be able to pull one over on the Word of God made flesh? Well, the truth is, Satan did think that, as astonishing as that may sound. As a matter of fact, even after Jesus perfectly resisted the devil three times, Luke says, when the devil had ended every temptation, he just went away until a more opportune time. Questions about angels and demons are among some of the most common questions you get as a pastor. Unfortunately, most of those answers, at least for me, involve something like, I don't know. We can't know. It doesn't tell us. Why doesn't it tell us? Why doesn't Scripture give us more information on the devil and demons and angels? Well, I think because our focus is supposed to be on Jesus, as we have learned time and time throughout history, and as you read the book of Hebrews, men have a tendency of worshiping angels. The, de the angels can't save us. The devil and his angels only want to destroy us. Why would our focus be on them anyway? Jesus told us all we need to know about the devil in John 8. He has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because the devil hates the truth, because he hates everyone who loves the truth and believes that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, as we read this text today about 
Satan tempting Jesus, we should expect the same thing ourselves. Because it is happening, whether you see it or not. The devil wasn't always the devil. He was first created as Lucifer, the angel of light, one of the top angels in the hierarchy of heaven. Satan certainly knows who God is. There's no doubt he knows who Jesus is as the Son of God. For reasons we can't know, he became the devil because he tried to overthrow and overpower God in heaven. That didn't end well. And now for reasons even further out of our comprehension, Satan, despite knowing exactly who it is he's tempting, proceeds anyway. See, there's a difference between knowing and believing. There's a big, eternal difference between knowing God is real, knowing Jesus is the Lord, and trusting in Him, believing what He says. It's because the devil does not believe the words of God, because the devil has never heeded what he has heard from the beginning, he dares even to attempt to deceive God himself. I mean, I don't know, maybe the devil thought, you know, the first time I tried to take him on in heaven. Now, he's a baby, nursing. Maybe there's a loophole now. Maybe there's an angle I can get. I don't know if that's what the devil was thinking or not, but the point isn't what the devil was thinking. The point is what the devil could not do, what he failed miserably to do. Jesus remained perfectly faithful to God and resisted the devil and every temptation in every way that we have failed to do. That's the important part. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, We do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Sympathy means to truly understand someone and what they're going through because you've been through that exact situation. Empathy is usually what we have for other people. Empathy doesn't understand exactly what it's like to be where that person is because I'm not that person, but I seek to get some level of understanding to have pity on them. Not only for Jesus to be able to sympathize with us, but in order for Jesus to be able to serve God in our place, in order for him to die for our sins, in order for him to rise again to give us new life, He had to become genuinely as we are, weak. He had to be genuinely tempted, not just experience physical frailty and hunger, but spiritual vulnerability. Of course, it was not possible for Jesus to sin because he was and is the Son of God. So I can't explain it to you how he could never sin, but yet he was genuinely tempted. But that's what the book says. In his first two temptations, the devil told Jesus, if you are the Son of God, you see, the devil knew. It's not that he didn't know. You and I know. I mean, that's what James says in chapter 2. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. But as I said earlier, There's a big difference between knowing, a big difference between believing a fact and trusting, obeying, heeding what you've heard, what you know and confess to be true. Though the devil refused to believe Jesus to be the Son of God, despite what he knew, that didn't affect our Lord at all because he did heed what he heard. He knew who he was, and he knew he was the Son of God because he believed what God said about him. 
Unlike the devil and unlike you and I, Jesus never faltered in heeding those words of God that were spoken and given to him. Jesus' temptation occurred immediately after his baptism, and it's important that we connect the two because they are connected. It was at his baptism, just before our text for today in Luke 3, it says, when Jesus had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So it shouldn't be any surprise that immediately after Jesus was baptized, immediately after grace, the tempter comes. Jesus wasn't baptized because he had any sins that had to be forgiven. He was baptized, as he told John, to fulfill all righteousness, our righteousness, to identify with sinners and to be identified as the Son of God at the same time by God himself. And that's important to understand because it starts to answer some other common questions about Jesus' temptation. For example, in verse 1, Luke says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. I thought we prayed in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Why is the Spirit of God leading Jesus into the wilderness? I mean, James 1 says, God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Well, let's make sure we read the text carefully. First of all, it doesn't say God tempted Jesus. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Satan tempted Jesus. And why did God have to lead Jesus? Well, Unlike us, sinners who wantonly run headfirst into temptation, who even welcome it in our weakness, Jesus would never go there. He would never put himself in a situation to be tempted. He would have never put himself in a situation to compromise his relationship with his father. The only way that was going to happen is if God told him to go there. And so in order to fulfill our righteousness, God led his son to be tempted as we are. As the perfect son of God, Jesus listened to the Father only. Though the devil would try as he might to deceive Jesus, even twisting the word of God itself, just like he did in the Garden of Eden, Jesus lived perfectly faithful to the words that he had heard. As Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but I speak just as the Father taught me. Jesus perfectly heeded all that he heard. And the good news of the gospel, my friends, is that Jesus has made those same words available for you to hear and available for you to heed. As you read your Bible and you read about how our Lord walked before God, constantly in prayer, all about his father's business, even from the time he was 12 in the temple, reading, thinking, meditating, knowing God, living according to his word. Jesus never put himself in situations that were unnecessarily risky. Instead, we see Jesus doing the opposite after this temptation in the wilderness. After his victory, we see him then willingly going into the wilderness throughout his ministry to intentionally empty out himself. Though he was and is the very word of God in the flesh, the mystery of the God-man is that Jesus never considered himself to be capable on his own. Jesus himself depended on the Father for everything. And isn't that when we experience the most pain and trouble in our own life? When we think, I got this. Everything's fine. 
I don't, I don't have any emergency right now. I don't need to pray right now. I don't need to get into the Word again today. I don't need to go to the church again. It's good. It's fine. I got it. That's exactly what Jesus was being tempted with by Satan. Hey, you've got the power. Turn this stone into bread. Could he have done it? Yeah, and he would, right? The fish and the loaves. But he's not going to do it for his own benefit. He's not going to do it unless the Father says so. In his humanity, Jesus prevailed over the devil and found true life and salvation through living by three words. It is written. Period. See, much like the devil didn't struggle to know but believe, it's not that we don't know what the Bible says. We know. This is the problem. It's not as hard to understand as you think. The Bible is a spiritual book. That's the challenge, living and active, and it confronts that sinner within our heart. It tells us you don't have everything under control, but it's not for you to control. It's for the one who overcame perfectly in the wilderness to control. That's whom you should run to in temptation. I'll never forget when I was living at my grandparents' house for a while. My wife can tell you this. Uh, my grandfather, wonderful man, Christian man, Bible teacher for 33 years, would stand in that backyard and he would scream at the devil. And my grandmother would walk through the house shaking her head. I don't know why he's doing that. The devil's not afraid of him. Why in the world would he be out there yelling at the devil? <laughs> She's right. I mean, the men in my family, we have a pressure valve and you have to let that off sometimes just for everyone's sake. But the devil's not afraid of us. God hasn't given us the word so that we can somehow master it enough to fend off the devil. No, our only hope and temptation is to have a relationship with God now. Jesus said that's where you find the spirit to be filled with in his word. The temptations of the devil and our own sinful nature, nature are constant. And if our Lord depended upon the Word of God, why would we depend on anything else? But you also have to know the Word. The Word of God is not a magic book of potions. It's not individual bits of advice. It's not just some feel-good book to, to, for self-improvement. It is how you have a relationship with the Almighty God. It's not something you just break out in case of an emergency, because by then it's too late. It was Benjamin Franklin who said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's why the season of Lent reminds us to live in repentance, so that we can be filled. The good news of the gospel is Jesus has already done it. That's the strength and temptation, even when we fail, I'm forgiven. But that grace is the very thing that should motivate us to resist, to run back to our heavenly Father. As Jesus said, to be holy because your Father is holy. Jesus has already overcome temptation, paid for our failures and sins, saved us from the judgment our sins deserve. And the Word of God says that because we have believed in Jesus and are baptized children of God, we've already been raised with Christ. So the fear in temptation is not jeopardizing our salvation. That's in His hands. We resist temptation because God comes to us even now to offer us the fullness of His kingdom. And when we give in to temptation, we leave ourselves unable to receive that fullness. Heed what you have heard. And what have you heard? You've heard that in your baptism, those very same words God spoke to his son, you are a child of God because of what he has done for you, because of the sins Christ paid for and absolved you of. You come here 
this morning and here. This is my body. This is my blood given for the forgiveness of your sins. His grace, his victory is what we have heard. Let us heed what we have heard. Amen.